Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 is a poem written in praise of wisdom. Its first and last word is written in some English Bible translations as happy. And in other translations, it uses the word blessed. Now, way back before we had to quit meeting, we learned that that word blessed means to be at one with God. Can you think of any other happy state of being other than being at one with God? When was the last time you had a real sense of peace in your life? I've told a couple of people in my remembrance that the happiest place to be is to be in the very center of God's will. And the most miserable place to be is anywhere outside of God's will. And the ancient Hebrew language contained two distinct terms that could be translated into English as blessed. And one of these two terms was used consistently to refer to God's activity toward His creation including human beings. And I think about that time when he was creating all that he spoke into being. And after he created it, he said, and it was good. And those same terms appear, for example, in Proverbs 3.33 to convey that God blesses the home of the righteous. And I see homes around us today, and I wonder if any of those homes experience blessedness. When I go to my own daughter's home, there just seems to be a sense of hubbub. I don't know another word. And I, I use hubbub not to mean that anything's going wrong. It's just frantic activity. Where's my piano book? Well, where'd you have it last? I don't know. Avery had it. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No blessedness. No sense of being at peace. And the other word for being blessed points, points more to the result in people's lives. That is, people are blessed or people are happy. Where are those television shows that showed the happy families? Ward Cleaver. Leave it to Beaver. The family sitting around the table enjoying a meal together. Well, these last three months, Karen and I have eaten quite a few meals together. And I've heard from a lot of our families in the church that hey, we sat down and had a meal together. Evidently, before these last three months, they weren't having too many meals together. And that's the Hebrew term that's found in Proverbs 3.13 and 3.18. And then Proverbs 3.19 through 20 asserts that wisdom pl played a role in creation, and it's the cosmic magnitude of wisdom that's kind of an addendum to the poem. And this theme finds an even greater expression in verses 22 through 31. And it's wisdom in daily life. And since the world exists through wisdom, it's conveying the sense that wisdom is essential for daily survival. Do you, con do you have a consciousness of wisdom that's necessary for your daily survival? I mean, pretty much there's a lot of stuff at my house that I don't even have to think about. I just punch a button and the coffee maker does, it thing, does its thing.
<laughs> and, and you don't even have to fill that pen up. When that one runs dry, you chunk it and get another one. Yeah. Wisdom provides our security, our serenity, and ultimately, if we think about it long enough, it comes from a right relationship with God. That's what Solomon is talking about. And then in verses 27 through 35, he presents a number of prohibitions against malevolent behavior. The enticement of acquiring material riches that can overwhelm human decency. And he begins to talk about personal relationships are more valuable than illegitimate acquire, acquisition of material possessions. Now look with me at our text as we go verse by verse. Chapter 3, verse 21. And Solomon explains that the person who trusts in God will find rest from fear. Verse 21, he says, Maintain sound wisdom and discretion, my son. Don't lose sight of them. Did you get a sense or do you get a sense of Solomon's age as he's writing these things? We've studied Proverbs many times as we go through this book again. How old do you think Solomon is as he's writing it this time? I would think he'd be pretty old. Because I think a lot, a lot of this is just his way of reflecting back, you know, on his life and times. I kind of got, got the sense, uh, Larry, that he's... Um, He's made his mistakes and learned from them, and so he's trying to keep his son from making those mistakes. Yeah, I, th I think so too. And he opens with an affectionate, appeal, an affectionate appeal of a parent to a child. And one of the commentary writers said that this book originally may have served as a textbook for teaching adolescent boys. Any of you men ever teach uh, junior boys or teenage boys? Ed, I know you did. That's a, that's a pretty tough sell to try to teach that age boy. And he addresses the learner as my son. I think that's a general term. He's, pro term. he's probably not teaching his son, but he's referring to those age boys. Maintain your sense. Um, Will will tell you some of the guys when we're teasing sometimes, I'll, I'll tell them, don't let your mouth overload your brain. Don't lose your head. Maintain sound wisdom, sound judgment. Use discretion. And sound wisdom here is a technical term that describes good judgment, practical success in life. Don't lose sight of those things that make sense. And he's saying, don't let them depart from your eyes. Always keep your head about you. Verse 22, they will be life for you and adornment for your neck. We've studied before how the Hebrews would take Scripture and put them in little boxes, plactertes, and they would bind them on their foreheads, they would put them on their wrists, as if they would actually penetrate into their minds and get into their life by binding them on themselves. Here he says, hang them around your neck. Well, we sometimes wear crosses as jewelry. Now, we know that actually doesn't do anything for us, but it shows others we're a Christian. Sometimes we inscribe things on lockets, on the back of a watch, 
we know that doesn't really do anything. But when we look at it, it reminds us of something. And he's saying here, you're not actually wearing them, but as if you were wearing them, keep them in mind. Always have them where you keep them in mind so that you won't stumble and fall. And then verse 23, then you will go safely on your way and your foot will not stumble. And here he's going back to a term he's used several times, walking. And we use that same terminology as you walk through life, as you go through life. It's the progression of a human, of human lifetime. It's often accompanied by terms that have some moral or religious connotation. One's lifestyle is comprised of the choices and actions one, make, one makes. And that way in life sometimes becomes a beaten way. Habits. How hard is it to break a habit once you've established it? Do you have habits? Some of them are easier to break than others. You know, like when I used to smoke, that was a terrible habit to break. And then others, you know, are easier than that. I find security in a routine. I, I like to do things the same way time after time after time. And I can get in the habit real easy. And sometimes that frustrates my wife. I just like to do things. I like my chair in the same place. Don't move my chair. And in our journey of life, sometimes we develop habits that are not good habits. But Solomon is using it in a figurative sense here that if you get in the habit of doing things the right way and you have these good things at hand, your good sense about you, it comes in good stead when you are tempted to do wrong. Forever secure in your relationship with God, God's wisdom, using good sense. Verse 24, he carries it further. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be, present, will be pleasant. You ever have troubled sleep? The term somnophobia, it's called sleep anxiety. Are you troubled by sleep some? I used to laugh at the old folks when they'd say they had trouble sleeping. It ain't funny anymore. And somnophobia is an inordinate fear of going to sleep that can debilitate those who suffer from it. And I've gotten to where I hate to see it get dark because I know I've got to go in there and try to get to sleep. People are the same. Folks in Solomon's day, the older people, had trouble sleeping. We still have trouble sleeping. Their homes weren't as secure as our homes now. And they had fears to overcome. God was watching over them then, and God is watching over us now. He moves on in verses 25 through 26. Don't fear sudden danger or the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from a snare. He's using terms that they would have been very familiar with. We still have fear of sudden danger. There are some things that we just cannot prepare for. And when those things do befall us, God is still at hand watching over us. The wicked are still in our world. 
Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. And the consequences of the wickedness still happen around us. Wicked people are a threat to the tranquility of any community. Just turn on the news. And the fear of being mistreated by wicked people, wicked people can lead believers to fail to act and minister to the needs of others. But Solomon goes on, For the Lord will be your confidence is the, is the climax of this passage. And confidence is the outcome of faith in the Lord. We have all experienced some kind of tragedy in the past. It helps to have a good memory. How did the Lord respond to you in the past? He took care of us. And God didn't bring us this far to abandon us and fail us in the future. Put your trust in God alone. And wise believers depend ultimately on God to guide, guard, and protect. God offers His peace to those who trust in Him. And Solomon directed God's people to act quickly to help their neighbors. Believers should never abuse neighbors' trust or plan or harm against anyone. Verse 27, When it is in your power, don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. It's still right to help others. And then he moves in verses 27 through 30 to four negative injunctions. The prohibitions in various forms um, to warn these young men of what not to do. The subject matter of these teachings can be found in non-Israelite writings of the time as well. And there's no immediate theological basis for these exhortations. And no spiritual consequences either are outlined. And these facts caution us to avoid over-compartmentalizing life into separate realms of spiritual or secular in this case. And Solomon is as concerned with a respectable comportment as he is with religious zeal. God's people should exhibit well-mannered and ethical behavior in every arena of their lives, not just when they're in church. What's he saying here? That when we're out and about in the world, we're expected to act like God's people just like we do on Sunday. And the phrase, when it is within your power, there are limits to our powers. There's just so much we can do. There's some things we can't do anything about. But when we can do something about it, we're expected to do it. And the Hebrew word that's rendered power here is El. E-L. And it's a general term that means God. It often appears in Scripture <clears throat> in compound names such as Bethel, house of God, or Israel, prince of God. And the term Elohim appears in Genesis 1. It's the, it's the designation of God the Creator. It also can be used in reference to pagan false gods, like it talked about uh, of Baal. Baal. In Proverbs 3.27, it's clear, it's clear when it refers to human power and ability, those powers that can fall, fail or fall. Here, the one to whom it belongs points to the legitimacy of receiving good, and it cannot be limited in application. When we can do good, we're expected to do good, and it can refer to a vast range of needs, from an employee receiving his or her full wages promptly after performing a job, or a plea of the impoverished for help. It's the, the sense of the verse is clear. If we encounter someone who needs help, do what we can to meet that need quickly and compassionately. Verse 28. Don't say to your neighbor, go away, come back later. I'll give it tomorrow. When it is there, be with you. It's like uh, in the New Testament, there's one instance when Jesus speaks of it and somebody says, I'm cold, and you just say, be warm. 
I used to get frustrated way back in the day when we didn't have air conditioners in the school. You remember those days? Everybody does except Will. I had a teacher that we would come in from recess and all sweaty and hot, and you'd put your arm down, your paper would stick to your arm. Y'all remember those days? And the teacher would say, think of a cool ice cream cone. That just make me so mad I could just... <clears throat> Didn't make me a bit cooler, did you? No. Well, you can't say to someone who is cold, be warm and do them any good. This scripture is saying if you have within your power to help someone, help them. If it's beyond your ability to help them, there's nothing you can do about it. In a society that lived from one day to the next, receiving payment for labor on a daily basis was critical to survival. And evidently in one, from the commentary, there was the habit of some unscrupulous people to hire someone to work and then not pay them at the end of the day. And those workers depended on that daily wage to be able to feed their families. And Solomon was speaking specifically to that. Here in Proverbs 3.28, it refers to one who is owed compensation as a neighbor. And the term neighbor applies to an understanding of the community connection between the parties. And the one who hires and owes compensation for work should not look on the worker as subhuman or without needs, but as a fellow human being worthy of respect and prompt payment. Verse 29. Don't plan any harm against your neighbor, for he trusts you and lives near you. This third negative injunction prohibits the planning of harm against <clears throat> unsuspecting neighbors. The two familiar biblical examples of large-scale malevolence includes the plot of Naboth against Ahaz and Jezebel and Haman's scheme in the days of Esther. You remember those two examples? The Hebrew word that's rendered neighbor here is a broad range of meaning. You remember the um, scribe who asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who do you consider your neighbor to be? It goes beyond just who lives next door to you. It's anyone in your community. And it even extends beyond that. It could be even a stranger who is passing through your community. Someone that you have learned about. It could be a victim who places their trust in you for a need. At the outside, Jesus extended that to the Good Samaritan. That Samaritan extended his good to that person on the side of the road that needed help. And the stage was set for that parable. The more important question Jesus explained is not who is one's neighbor, but was, what does it mean to act as a neighbor, showing mercy to anyone who is in need. Verse 30, Don't accuse anyone without cause when he has done you no harm. And this fourth negative injunction can imply to anything from falsely accusing someone to filing frivolous lawsuits. Our courts are full of frivolous lawsuits. And the injunction employs legal terminology here, and it relates to the judicial system of ancient Israel. Evidently, they had problems in those days just like we do now. This person will seek legal action over the flimsiest pretext and sometimes for no reason other than malice. And the ninth commandment prohibits false testimony against one's neighbor. Flippant, ac flippant accusations that are not rooted in genuine violations of the law, but false testimony against a neighbor. And Solomon warned about desiring the possessions of the wealthy who secured it through violence and wickedness. Here he emphasizes that God blesses the righteous, offering them grace, His grace and honor. Verse 31, don't envy a violent man or choose any, any of his ways. 
And after a brief interlude instructing God's people to demonstrate kindness by acting quickly to help their neighbors, Solomon returns to the attitudes and actions that they needed to, to avoid. So he draws attention to individuals who resort to violence as a mean to gain selfish desires. Such a person often seeks to intimidate others with threats and stockpiling material wealth without consideration of anyone else's needs. We've just come through a, a situation from toilet paper to paper towels to anything. I, I check the stores now just looking for the simple thing of cream of celery soup. Hadn't found it yet. Don't know who's got it all, but they stockpiling it somewhere. Because of their wealth and brutish attitudes, Solomon talks about this violent oppressor, people who acquire some type of prestige and clout in the community, and albeit a reputu reputation that's based on terror. And he's saying that the wise believer would resist this temptation and not envy or choose to emulate this violent person's ways of attaining power. This uh, one commentary writer said this may lie behind the reason for verses 27 through 30. Verse 32, For the devious are detestable to the Lord, but he is a friend to the upright. More importantly, he says to, to align oneself with the violent and the devious, I think the King James says, uses the term the forward, NIV says the perverse, is to become detestable to the Lord. The Lord detests individuals who, are, who habitually treat others in ways that are abominations to the Lord. This term detestable is extremely strong in the original language. It's something that is repugnant to God. And this is behavior that God loathes and would not allow to go unpunished. And in contrast, the Lord is a friend to those. And it speaks in the King James of someone that God is in secret a friend with. I found that to be a strange phrasing. Have you ever thought about God being friends in secret with somebody? I wanted to study that a little bit long, a little bit more to find out what the background of that phrasing was. God being in friends at being friends in secret with someone. I had never thought about that before. Those who are right with the Lord and live by his revealed wisdom will always find them in his favor and empowered by his grace. Verse 33, the Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Here in this verse, he has two distinctly opposite fates, the wicked who are cursed and the righteous who are blessed. And Solomon lays out the ultimate fate of the wicked, the curses. And then he repeats the use of God's covenant name, Yahweh. That's the same name that he told Moses to carry back to Pharaoh. I am that I am. And the ultimate destiny of each of these lifestyles are, at pole, are poles apart. In the second presentation of the covenant in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses stipulates in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy the curses that would attend disobedience. I guess in all of my study throughout the years, that book we study very, very little, if at all. Have you thought much about the curses? And Solomon here is clearly consistent with Moses' proclamation on the wicked. A curse on the household of the wicked. Or to put it in a different phraseology, the home of the wicked is cursed. Not just the wicked himself, but his home is cursed. 
that's pretty serious when you think about a person's home being cursed. It's bad enough that the person themselves is cursed. In the King James, it says the habitation of the cursed. Any thoughts there? Because the buzzards were roosting over your house? Wow. I never heard that before. I never heard the buzzards. Mm. <laughs> I'd be shooing them off too. Well, when the hurricane hit, we all thought our houses were cursed. Yeah, what? Well, in times past, there was a whole lot more thought about curses and blessings than we think about today. And people pronounced blessings a lot more. And we spoke and, t and we still talk about it at our house before a meal. Will you ask the blessing today? We, we use that term frequently when people come. I mean, that's just the general term we use. Will you ask the blessing? And I heard people talk about it a lot more in my younger days than I hear it now. But I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody pronounce a curse on anyone. Verse 34, He mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. Now, our teenagers certainly know a lot about mocking. I hear my grands mimic, I, I hesitate to use the word mock, but they're pretty good at m mimicking. They can, they can mock the way I walk <laughs> real well. <laughs> they treat God's instructions and his followers with contempt. And I guess there, there are certain words that really get my attention. And the GD and the F words really boil my blood, especially if there are children around. And there, in our world today, there seems to be no filter on language. And the Hebrew term that's rendered here, the humble, Usually when we think in terms of humble, or I always pronounce it humble, but humble, we think are poor. And we think of the poor as being exploited by the wicked, but that's not necessarily always true. The New Testament writers James and Peter quoted this proverb in their letters to the scattered believers that were facing persecution for their faith. And in those cases, most of them were exploited. They knew that when they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior in their world, they more than likely lost their connection with their families and with their ways of making a living. And the principle revealed in the verse remains clear. God helps those who cannot help themselves and who turn to Him for that in help. We are more familiar with a principle that's been vastly different from the popular misleading saying, God helps those who help themselves. Did you grow up with that verse? So did I. But it's kind of misleading. Most of the time that I heard that, it was an excuse not to help somebody. The humble admit they cannot help themselves. And in some cases, that's a truth statement. There are folks that absolutely cannot help themselves. 
And when I have had the few times when somebody has, ad somebody has admitted that, they are absolutely crestfallen and broken. And in those few times, I would have done everything I could to move a mountain to help those folks. Verse 35. The wise will inherit honor, but he holds up fools to dishonor. And there's that word that was a really bad word, and you dare not call anybody a fool in the house I grew up in. And Solomon summarized his appeal for young Israelites to maintain sound wisdom and discretion. And he's here again, here again, he's using opposite destinies. The destiny of the wise and the destiny of the fools. We just saw him talk about the curse on the wicked and the blessedness of the righteous. And both groups bear accountability for their choices. Here it's a choice to obey God or to reject godly wisdom. And it's a choice. Those who seek to embrace wisdom will inherit honor. And those who reject godly wisdom, God will not honor a fool. And one of the commentary writers wrote, an inheritance is a permanent acquisition. Paul, you and I have used the, right, the phrase before, you can't fix stupid. And the Hebrew word that's rendered honor literally means weightiness. The wise receive an enduring good reputation, a prize of eternal value. In days gone by, a reputation was worth something, more than money in a community. It meant something to my grandparents, their place in the community. Because when I'd go out the door, boy, remember who you are. And I didn't want anything bad to get back home before me. I didn't want anything bad to get back home at all. And in contrast to those who choose to scorn and reject God, God's wisdom is utterly foolish. And the word that's rendered fools doesn't refer to lack of mental capacity it's not talking about somebody who doesn't have the mental ability to make good choices. It's talking about a stubborn rejection of God and His ways. A fool could be quite intelligent, but completely void of spiritual foundation. Somebody who knows to do right but just chooses not to. That person would be truly a fool. Someone who just satisfies selfish desires. And so their ultimate inheritance is dishonor or shame. And Paul put the two opposing destinies in equally stark terms. He says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. There are only two destinies. Heaven or hell. There ain't but two places to go. There ain't a third one. There's not an in-between. And God honors one and rejects the other. And I think that's the most difficult person to witness to is someone who is truly very, very intelligent. Who cannot see 
the wisdom of choosing Christ. And everyone has the same choice. Which destiny have you chosen? And Solomon is telling these young men, keep your head about you. Make good choices. Isn't that what we tell our young people as we're bringing them up? All of us have made our mistakes. I think Solomon was in that same place. Son, don't go the same place I have. I want to keep you from making these false steps. Follow the Lord. Make good choices. Receive an enduring inheritance. It lasts forever. Thoughts or words this morning? Absolutely better than talking into that teleprompter. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to meet once again together to study your word. I pray that you would help all of us, Lord, to make wise decisions, to follow your leading. Lord, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us. Lead, guide, guard, and direct us. Help us to be wise. In Jesus' name I pray.